This is Tom Hames. I'm the interviewer of Eugene Hames. Today's date is the 30th of October, 2001. We are at the 10th Mountain Division Resource Center at the Denver Public Library, the Western History section. The current address of Eugene Hames is 6119 Briarwood Circle in Englewood, Colorado. I am Gene Hames's son. We're doing this oral history today on a JVC camera. It is a GRS 505. We're using a Sony VHH, VHS tape. And I'd like the interviewee to give his name, age, date of birth, and place of birth. My full name is Eugene Sanford Hames. My address is 6119 East Briarwood Circle in Centennial, Colorado. I was born on July 24, 1920 on a ranch near Phillipsburg, Montana. My dad was the foreman of the ranch and uh, my mother uh, took care of the family. I was the fifth child that she had. She had seven children all together and raised six of us. When I was expected, a neighbor lady came over to stay with my mother. My dad took the buggy and went to Phillipsburg to get the doctor, but I arrived before they got back. With your brothers and sisters, could you give their names and ages, please? Yes, my oldest sister was named Doris, and she is deceased. My oldest brother was Lewis. He is also deceased. My next brother was Lee, and he is 84 years old and lives uh, near Missoula, Montana. My younger sister, Ruth, is deceased, and my younger brother, Dale, is also deceased. For your siblings, did any of them serve in the armed forces in the Second World War? Yes, there were three of us who served in the military during World War II. My oldest brother, Lewis, enlisted in the Marine Corps, and he served out in the Pacific, and he uh, was in a number of major engagements out there. He stayed in the military for over 25 years and then retired. My brother, Lee, was drafted, and he was sent to OCS at Fort Sill, Oklahoma. He received a commission and was assigned to the field artillery. He served in a number of camps in this country, and ultimately his outfit, which was the 601st Field Artillery Battalion, was transferred and assigned to Kunming, China. So he spent most of the war in that theater. Now, your brother Louis was in the Marines, correct? Yes. Do you recall his uh, unit? I don't. He was in several different units. I know he was a master sergeant by the time the war ended. Tell me a little bit about um, growing up in uh, Montana. Uh, did you move from uh, Stevensville at some point to Missoula, and were you raised on a farm or ranch or in town? Yes. When we lived uh, at uh, at or near Phillipsburg, we lived on a farm, but we were uh, not there very long after I was born. We moved back to the Bitterroot Valley, and we first lived on a ranch near the town of Stevensville. It was called the Fort Owen Ranch, and we lived there several years, and then my father rented what they call the old gristmill ranch which was 10 miles east of Stevensville. And we lived there until 1931. And at that time, we moved into Missoula. And we lived in Missoula then uh, all the while that I was in high school. And for some years, my parents lived there even during World War II. When you were in high school, did you also uh, have jobs? Yes, we had paper routes. Uh, my oldest brother worked for a bakery. He rode around with the delivery truck and helped 
deliver, and we worked at several different things. Uh, I worked in a um, truck garden during the summer months. We got a dollar a day, and we worked about nine hours. We also worked in the hay fields near uh, the town of Missoula. What year did you graduate from high school? 1937. Tell me about uh, Missoula High School at the time. What was its size? What was it like? At that time, Missoula only had one high school, and it was called Missoula County High School. So all the students in the county came to that school. Uh, it was quite a large school, and I think a very good educational facility. I, of course, attended four years, and the reputation of the school was very good. Uh, when I graduated in 1937, the Depression was pretty well over by that time due to the war, and I had a choice to either go to, to work for the Northern Pacific Railroad as a brakeman or to go to work in one of the logging camps. The logging camp sounded more interesting to me than working in the railroad yards in Missoula, so I, t I went to work in the woods. I was only 16, and I was the youngest man in camp. The camp ha held about 200 men. Were you um, an actual logger where you were the one falling the trees? I eventually was. When I first went up there, I went to work on a railroad building crew to build some railroad into an area where the ACM company was going to log, but later I became a timber faller. We fell trees with the old two-man crosscut saw. At that time, we didn't have chainsaws, and we would uh, uh, saw into the tree, cut out an undercut, chop that out with double-bitted axes, and then we would fall the tree. And our job required us to limb the tree, measure it, and cut off the top so it could be skidded down to the landing where they would load the logs onto railroad cars. Now, when you went into the woods to work in the logging camps, how old were you? I was 16. And was that a younger age, or were there a lot of 16-year-olds in the woods? No, I was the only one that young. Uh, I had two brothers working there, too. Of course, they were both older than I was. But uh, basically, the lumberjacks were probably men that were of age and on up to 50 or 60 years of age. How did you get along with many of the older lumberjacks? I got along very well. I uh, learned initially to keep my mouth shut and not to say anything to them that I shouldn't say. And actually, I got along famously. I had no problem. They were all nice to me. They were real, hard-working, honest men. Now, this was the tail end or just after the Depression. How were the living conditions at the logging camp? Things like, um, uh, where did you sleep and how did you eat? Was it in barracks? That type of thing. We uh, lived in bunkhouses. There were 16 men in each bunkhouse, and there was a big round stove in the middle of the room. And of course, in the wintertime, the stove was kept going to provide heat. There was a mess hall where we all ate, and the mess hall would seat about 250 men. They served the food family style. They used men waiters, we call them flunkies, and they would bring out uh, the food like meat or potatoes or vegetables in big bowls then you would help yourself. You could eat all you wanted, and it was quite a thing for me to have that much food available. I put on 40 pounds the first year I worked in the woods. And of course, a lot of that was muscle, too, from the hard work I was doing. Now, you went to the logging camp right out of high school. Yes. And you were at the logging camp for how many years before um, Pearl Harbor? Well, I went to work there in 37, and Pearl Harbor was in 41. Now, there were times when the uh, logging camps would shut down.
for example, every spring, uh, when the spring runoff came, the big caterpillars couldn't skid the logs because it was too wet. So the camp would shut down for about a month or six weeks. And during those periods, I would then work as a brakeman for the Northern Pacific Railroad in Missoula. Now you did work in the, the lumber camp, so in the winter, correct? Yes. Now tell me about that. Uh, was that challenging? Well, it was a very challenging because the winters in Montana are severe. I know many times uh, we would work in weather that was 35 degrees below zero. I can't at this time in the winters I worked there ever recall a time when we didn't go out to work because of the weather. Whether it was snowing or blowing and extremely cold, we went to work. Now where were you on December 7, 1941 when Pearl Harbor was attacked? At that time I had been uh, laid off. The camp shut down for some reason and I don't know why. I think it shut down in the fall and hadn't reopened by December and I took a job uh, working as a bellhop at the Palace Hotel in Missoula. It was on a Sunday and I remember I was working and I was in the hotel lobby uh, when the Japanese attacked Pearl Harbor. Did you learn by way of radio or did someone tell you? I think somebody told me. I don't think we had a radio. Uh, there were radios in the hotel, but I don't think we had it on. As I recall, I think someone came in the hotel and told us. And what was your reaction upon hearing the news of the attack? Well, of course, I was greatly surprised. Uh, we had uh, been aware, of course, of the fact that there were uh, meetings between the Japanese people and uh, people from Washington, D.C. that had been un ongoing, but it surprised all of us when they pulled the surprise attack on Pearl Harbor. It, it, of course, angered me, too, because it was such a cowardly thing to do. Now, at that time, you were single, correct? Yes. And um, to jump ahead a little bit, you are retired at present, correct? Yes, I am. And what was your occupation before you retired? I was a practicing attorney in Denver. Did you have your own law firm? Yes, I was a founding member of the law firm of Wood, Riss, and Hames, and we practiced in Denver from about 1952 up to the present time. I retired from the practice in uh, 1990. Very good. Let me take you back again to the 1941 time period. Uh, at some point, did you uh, consider that you were either going to be drafted or that you would volunteer for military service? Well, I had gone back to work in the woods, and I had a, an occupational deferment. Obviously, the country needed lumber, and I think most lumberjacks were exempt from military service. But uh, I drove into a service station in Missoula one weekend and I was talking to the service station manager and he told me that if he was my age that he would enlist into the army ski troops that were being formed at Camp Hale. Well I became very interested in the ski troops. There was quite a bit of publicity in the paper and in some of the magazines like Life magazine and so I became so interested in it that I finally decided to enlist and become a ski trooper. Well, where did you enlist? I actually enlisted at Butte, Montana. That was my point of induction into the service. And tell me about the process of enlisting. Uh, what do you recall about the method of entering into the service? Well, it was very simple. Uh, uh, I took an oath and um, they read me, I believe, uh, something from the Constitution, and then they swore me in, and I had to swear to support the United States and the Constitution, and then I was a member of the Army Infantry. Where did they first uh, send you or station you after you enlisted? 
I was sent by train by the Army to Salt Lake City and I was stationed at Fort Douglas, Utah for about a week. And in that week period, did you uh, have any initial reactions to your military service? Yes, I was quite surprised at uh, how um, orderly it was and how many orders you would get during the day. I recall on one day I pulled KP and another fellow and I peeled a couple sacks of potatoes. Uh, I got issued my first uniforms there and it felt somewhat strange to be in uh, an army uniform. I uh, also got the normal shots that uh, were given such as smallpox and diphtheria and I had never had a smallpox vaccination before. The rest of the time at uh, Fort Douglas was spent in uh, some physical examinations. They of course give you a dental exam before you went into the service and all of this was done while I was at Fort Douglas. Why did you pick the U.S. Army ski troops to enlist in? Well, the literature at that time that I read, they wanted outdoor men, men who had lived in the outdoors, and they wanted men that they thought could perform in cold weather and high altitude. Well, I had never done any skiing, nor had I ever done any rock climbing but I had worked in the woods for several years and I had lived on a ranch as a boy and I felt that I had enough outdoor experience that I could handle the cold weather and the higher altitude. Did your background in the lumber camps assist you in transitioning into military life? Yes, I think it helped a great deal. Now, I was uh, 22 years old when I went in to the military and of course, many of the men who came in were only 18 or 19, so I was uh, older than, than many of the men, and I was accustomed to being told what to do. We had a woods foreman, and he would uh, take us out and show us where we were to fall the timber and tell us how to do it if we didn't know how. So I think that the fact that I had worked was, was able to take orders and it lived out of doors helped me a great deal. Were you also somewhat familiar with uh, barracks style living and dining hall dining that was, that was uh, very much the military way of life? Yes, it, it was very similar and in fact the cook at the uh, logging camp was a sergeant in World War I. He was a mess sergeant and of course uh, there were 200 of us. We'd go in and sit at the tables. Each table, I think, held about 12 men and uh, you could not talk except to ask someone to pass you some food or something like that. And then when you were through eating, you had to leave. Then, of course, we slept in the bunk houses, uh, double tiered bunks, and there were 16 men in each uh, bunk house. We did have running water in the bunkhouse where you could wash or shave, if you wanted a shower, you had to go to a separate building. And of course, I mentioned the pop bellied stove that was in the middle of the, of the uh, bunkhouse. During the winter months, uh, they kept a fire going in the stove all night, 24 hours a day. And there was a man who was designated as bull cook, and he uh, kept the barracks clean and he assigned you your blankets when you checked in to go to work and he also kept the fires going and was just kind of a handyman around the camp. Now what was your rank upon enlistment into the service? I was a private. And your rank upon discharge after the war? I was a first lieutenant. Tell us where you went after being stationed briefly in Utah. Well, my next station, of course, was uh, Camp Hale. We went up to Camp Hale on the Denver and Rio Grande Railroad. There were a number of us in the same railroad car. We got there, it was sometime during the first week of March of 1943, 
there was still snow on the ground and it was quite cold and all of the ski troops who were around the area were deeply tanned and looked like they had spent the winter out of doors. Now which unit did you first receive your military assignment to? I was initially assigned to a company that they had designated as B Prime and I told you earlier that uh, the 87th was the oldest regiment. The 86th was formed about the time that I got there, so I was assigned to B Prime of the 86th Regiment. B Prime was later changed to E Company. Did you stay with uh, E Company of 86 throughout your training at Camp Hale? No, I stayed there for several months, and uh, during that time, I attended an NCO school. Uh, mind you, the uh, unit needed non-commissioned officers, and they also needed commissioned officers, particularly lieutenants. So they established an NCO school at, uh, for, at uh, Camp Hale, and I attended that for a month, and after I graduated, I was promoted to corporal. Uh, and then I stayed with E Company for several months and then ultimately I was transferred to headquarters second of the 86th Regiment. How long were you at Camp Hale? I stayed at Camp Hale until mid-July of 1944. And what happened in mid-July of 44 to cause you to leave Camp Hale? The 10th Mountain Division was transferred the entire division to Camp Swift, Texas, which was near the town of Austin. Well, let's talk about Camp Hale for a minute. What are some of your strongest memories of the training that you received at Camp Hale? First of all, I was surprised that it was as easy physically as it was. We didn't work near as hard as I had worked in the lumber camps. We didn't saw down trees or chop out undercuts, and the training consisted of, of a lot of hikes. It consisted of such things as firing weapons on the range, uh, learning how to use the bayonet on the bayonet course, and of course uh, close order drill and all the things that an infantry outfit normally does. Why don't you describe uh, the scene at Camp Hale, where it's located, what some of the conditions were. Camp Hale was located in a valley in the upper end of the Eagle River. There were mountains completely surrounding the camp, and when they built the camp, they had to haul in several million tons of soil to fill up a wet area, because there was a wet area kind of a pond toward the upper end of camp. The mountains were rugged. The camp itself was at 9,200 feet above sea level. And other than Camp Hale, the only thing in the valley was a little railroad station called Pando. And it was located at what I call the lower end of camp, which would be the north end of camp. There were several buildings there that were owned by the DNRG. What part about your training did you like the least? Oh, I don't think I ever enjoyed the bayonet course. Uh, I never did have to use the bayonet in combat, for which I was quite thankful. But the uh, thought of sticking somebody with a knife was not really something I looked forward to doing. I also I uh, did not really enjoy such things as close order drill, but they were a basic part of the infantry training. And of course you had to learn how to march so that they could move troops from one point to another. Was there a certain part of your training that you particularly enjoyed or excelled at? Well, I liked the hikes and I liked the ski training. Uh, I got some skiing that first spring when I was there. The snow stayed on the ground until April. Then the following winter I got a lot of skiing. And that winter uh, we got to go up to Cooper Hill 
and uh, stay there for a week, and then we could ride the big T-bar that the Army built. So we did get in quite a bit of downhill skiing. Uh, most of our skiing, however, was cross-country skiing, and many times we had a large rucksack on our back. Sometimes they weighed 40 or 50 pounds. Tell me about some of the uh, other training, such as rock climbing, that uh, you engaged in. Yes, they had two areas, one right at Camp Hale and one down at Homestake uh, Creek near uh, Highway 34, and they would take the company and we'd, we'd climb individually. We did some climbing with ropes and pitons. I never did get to be an accomplished rock climber, but uh, we did uh, train on the rocks, and we got so we could belay and uh, use the ropes and help people get up the mountain. And of course, we used some of our rock climbing later in Italy. Why don't we take a break at this point? Okay. We're continuing with the interview of Eugene Hames on October 30th, 2003 and we were talking about uh, Camp Hale. At the time you were in Camp Hale and all your training, um, what were the physical conditions like? You said it was somewhat easier than the logging camps, but how did you physically react to the training? Well, when I said it was easier than the logging camps, we didn't do the hard work that we did in the woods. Where for example, if you're on one end of a crosscut saw and you saw logs all day, that's extremely hard work. But at Camp Hale, uh, we would go out in the field. They held classes out in the field and had lectures. Of course, we did a lot of hiking. And then, of course, in the wintertime, we did a lot of cross-country skiing. And I mentioned skiing at uh, Cooper Hill. The, uh I was going to ask, how did you physically respond? Was your health good while you were there? Other than uh, the problem I had with my smallpox vaccination, my arm swelled up, and for the first month I was at Camp Hale, it was extremely hard to do things because uh, of the swelling in my arm. But once that was gone, I was quite healthy. I might add that at that time, I was a heavy smoker. And I uh, smoked while I was in the service and up until about a month before I was discharged in 1946 when I quit and I haven't smoked since. The, yeah. the health though uh, of the men in Camp Hale sometimes was not too good. Uh, for one thing, I mentioned that the camp was in a valley completely surrounded by mountains. The Denver and Rio Grande Railroad tracks ran up the west side of the valley and the big trains that came through there, the freight trains, would have several engines pushing them up the mountains and they all were belching out great clouds of black smoke. In addition to that, there were some 2,000 buildings in Camp Hale and all of those that were heated were heated with coal-burning furnaces. So there was a lot of, of coal smoke and coal dust in the air, and many of the men developed an upper respiratory reaction to that, and they would cough a lot. It got so bad that we called it the pando crud, and some of the men had to be transferred out. They couldn't stand the coal smoke and the high altitude and the cold weather. Now, while you were at Camp Hale, did you receive any promotions? Yes, I mentioned that uh, after I went to uh, NCO school, I was appointed uh, as a corporal. Then I went to sergeant, staff sergeant, and ultimately to first sergeant. And I was the first sergeant of headquarters, second of the 86th, when we left Camp Hale and went to Camp Swift, Texas. Tell me about the um, reassignment or the transfer of the division from Camp Hale to Camp Swift. Well, it was in the summertime. It was in mid-July, and uh, we did not have any suntan 
uniforms. We still had just the woolen uh, ODs that we were wearing. Uh, we went down there by train, and when we got off in the train at Bastrop, Texas, it was extremely hot and humid. We had to walk about seven miles to the camp, and I think more men fell out on that hike than fell out the entire time that we were at Camp Hale. It was so hot and it was so uh, humid that it, and such a change from being in the mountains that they didn't react to it very well. Uh, did the division change its equipment or gear from the high alpine equipment that you had at Camp Hale to more flatland or even tropical? Yes, we were issued sun tans and of course lightweight fatigues and that's what we wore while we were at Camp Swift. Tell me about some of the equipment at Camp Hale. Uh, how did it function? Were you testing new equipment? Those sorts of things. Well, we were uh, testing a lot of uh, ski equipment and climbing equipment. Uh, the Army uh, bought